Hereby, I open this academic ceremony in which Antonio Suarez Martins Neto will defend the academic thesis, essays on technology adoption and the labor market. May I invite you to present a summary of your study and the conclusions of your thesis? Thank you, dear director. I'm now going to share my screen. Thank you. I'll briefly present my thesis entitled Essays on Technology Adoption in the Labor Market. I'd like to start with an overall introduction of this project, which starts with the fact that technology is an integral part of our lives. Right now, I'm here presenting my thesis online because of technological progress. And in the economic literature, has there exists a long literature that discusses the relationship between technology and development. At the micro level, technology adoption is associated with productivity growth at the, mark, at the firm level and economic development at the macro level. However, there is also a different strain of the literature that discusses the fact that technology also brings numerous challenges, environmental, political challenges, but also it brings profound effects on the labor markets. Initially, this literature focused on the idea that technology would bring massive waves of unemployment, but lately it turned the focus towards difference between skills and occupational groups, in the sense that technology does not necessarily bring massive unemployment, but it does change the demand for certain skills, tasks, and occupational groups. This is the main topic of this thesis, with a special focus on the case of developing and emerging economies, which I'll present in four different chapters. In the first one, I ask, is there job polarization in developing economies? As I briefly mentioned, technology changes the demand for certain tasks and skills. Particularly in recent years, the adoption of digital technology reduced the cost of automation uh, and routine quantifiable tasks. As a result, the demand for routine jobs has decreased, resulting in a de declining demand for employment in the middle of the wage and skill distribution, the so-called job polarization. There's a large literature that discusses the evidence of job polarization in advanced economies. However, the literature in developing and emerging economies is quite scant, which we review in the first part of the chapter. Following our review, we find that there is a slower pace of job polarization in most developing and emerging economies. We also observe incipient job polarization and declining demand for routine jobs in certain economies, such as China, Brazil, and Mexico. With these results in mind, we then explore the theoretical mechanisms that could explain the slow pace of job polarization in developing economies. We distinguish three groups of explanations. The first one relates to limited technology adoption. Because of firms lack of capabilities, the extent of informality in developing economies, and the lack of appropriate human capital, technology adoption in those economies is likely lower. In fact, it is lower, which then reduce firms' ability to substitute routine workers. The second one relates to structural change in the sense that while most advanced economies are moving to manufacturing to services, we still observe in many emerging developing economies uh, industrialization. The last one relates to change in global value chains as advanced economies offshore routine workers to developing economies, thus increasing the employment and wages of those workers in the receiving economies. We finalize and conclude the chapter by identifying many gaps in the literature. In special, we realize that there is a need to improve our measures of firm level technology adoption to understand the adoption of those technologies in the context of developing economies. It, also, it is also important to improve the measure of test content of jobs across countries to improve our understanding of the impacts of technology adoption. And finally, 
we highlight the importance of micro leverage studies, understanding the transitions of workers following the displacement resulting from technology adoption. This is exactly the topic of the third chapter, routine biotechnological change and employee outcomes after mass layoffs. As I mentioned, even though there is no job polarization in Brazil, there is a declining demand for routine workers. Most studies have focused primarily on aggregate outcomes, thus failing to observe worker level effects. This is exactly the topic of this chapter in which I investigate the impact of routinization on the labor outcomes of displaced workers. I do so by using the employer employee data from Brazil and by taking firms mass layoffs as an exogenous shock and apply a difference in difference model. I then use a measure of routine intensity to test the heterogeneity between occupational groups. The figure on the left summarizes the main result. Workers in high routine occupations are more impacted after a mass layoff, suggesting that because of the declining demand for those occupations, it's harder for them to find a new job. And when they do find a new job, they receive lower wages. We find that these effects are particularly high for less educated workers. And we also find that those workers in routine occupations are more likely to have to switch occupations. Another example that because of the decline in demand, they must find opportunities in different jobs. In terms of policy recommendations, we believe this chapter can help and the finds in these chapters can help target occupations and groups to implementation of policies focusing on upskilling the workforce. We also highlight the need for robust social protection programs to help mitigate the negative consequences of technology-induced displacement. In the third chapter, I then focus on skills transferability and again look at the impacts of technology on workers in terms of displacement and how skills transferability can help them mitigate the negative impacts. Take the case, for instance, of dispatchers and pharmacy aides. They have a similar probability of automation-related displacement. However, dispatchers face a 21% higher increase in long-term unemployment. The reason being that for dispatchers, it's much higher, harder to find a job in a different occupation because of the skills they possess. Labor economists have long recognized the critical role played by skills transferability, highlighting its impacts on workers' movements between occupations and wages upon reemployment. Re what we do in this chapter is to study labor market mobility from a worker set of occupational skills and its transferability to other occupations. We first build a measure of skill transferability and then we focus on displaced workers and study how our measure relates to labor outcomes following the displacement. In addition to the fact that a higher skills transferability of occupation or occupational mobility increases the chances of job switching, we also find that following the displacement, as you can see on the figure on the left, workers with higher occupational transferability are more likely to find unemployment. In terms of police recommendation, the findings emphasize the crucial roles played by both public and private employment agencies in expediting job placement. Take, for instance, the case of workers with high skill transferability. Intermediation services can advise them to broaden their search and then facilitate job finding. For workers in low commonality occupations, our results stress the necessity of reskilling, ensuring they remain competitive and adaptable in a rapidly evolving job market. In the last chapter, I then take a step back and I try to understand the drivers of technology adoption in the context of a developing economy. There is a rapidly growing literature that has explored the links between trade and technology adoption, paying particular attention to competitive pressures and imports of intermediate goods. However, there is limited evidence about the role of exporting in technology diffusion. 
I combined three data sets, firm level data on the year of adoption of advanced technologies, Brazil's census of formal workers, and Brazil's export data from the Ministry of Trade to understand how entering exports markets affect technology adoption. I do so by applying a difference in difference with multiple periods to examine the effects. Again, the figure here on the left shows a summary of the main result. It shows that exporting is positively correlated with firms' likelihood of adopting advanced technologies. In this case, it shows that once firms enter the ex exporting markets, they start to export, they start adopting technologies associated with quality control. The findings are consistent with a model in which exporting increases firms' complexity and they need to adopt advanced technologies to cope with this complexity. It underlines the role of firms' interaction with buy buyers to reduce information asymmetries and spur technology adoption. It also, in terms of policy recommendation, underlines the significance of policies that combine exporting com promotion with initiatives to mitigate barriers to technology adoption. In conclusion, this thesis has used a series of novel data sets and applied robust methodology to examine the intricate interplay between technology adoption skills and the labor market. It provides novel evidence for the context of developing economies, highlighting the possible harmful effects of technology on the labor market. It draws several policy implications to help policymakers design policies that can mitigate these adverse impacts. And I conclude with a quote from Case and Ditton. If technological change and globalization have been responsible for, work, for hurting the working class, it is not because that's what technological change and globalization must do. It is because policy was neither wise nor imaginative. Thank you, dear I'll stop sharing. Thank you for your presentation. The opposition will be opened by Professor Dr. René Belderbos. He is Professor of International Corporate Strategy, Union Merit at Maastricht University. Yeah, thank you. Um, Dear candidate, uh, congratulations, first of all, with the completion of this dissertation. Um, I read it uh, with pleasure. Um, there are four well-crafted studies on the relationship between technology adoption and labor markets in the context of emerging economies, and in particular Brazil. Um, and I think each of these studies has some contribution to make uh, to the literature, and uh, some of these have already been published as well. So, uh, well done. Let me turn to my question. Uh, my question relates to chapter five. Uh, here you conduct a, a staggered difference in difference analysis, comparing uh, firms after and before, uh, uh, comparing exporting and non-exporting firms. Um, and you find that uh, after exporting, uh, firms are more likely to adopt ERP uh, software and also statistical quality control systems. Um, and you have some plausible explanations for this relationship uh, related to economies of scale, which then allow firms to uh, to invest in these technologies and also perhaps the greater quality demands from exporting uh, clients from clients in the export markets, which push firms to uh, enhance the, the quality control systems. So far, so good, but I, I do have two, uh, yeah, two critical comments on this. Um, I think there are two limitations in the chapters that are not so well recognized in the way it's written in the dissertation at the moment. Um, the first is that um, you suggest two mechanisms, but you don't really provide evidence that these mechanisms hold. Uh, second and more important is, yeah, you apply a causal inference technique, the difference in different techniques, um, but, and then to compare the treated and non-treated firms, but in fact, uh, the treatment is not exogenous in this case. Uh, exporting is an endogenous decision of firms related maybe to managerial capabilities, uh, product quality, uh, ambitions of firms. So these idiosyncratic features will lead both to export and maybe make also a technology adoption more likely. So it's very different. This difference and difference analysis in chapter five is very different from the analysis in chapter three, where you have a similar methodology, but there you have an exogenous shock, like a mass layoff, 
it is exogenous for uh, for an individual worker. But in this case, in the chapter five, in exporting, that's not the case. But it's not really reflected on in, in your dissertation. Um, so my conclusion would be that you have not really established causality uh, in uh, in chapter five, um, but you seem to have you seem to be claiming to have done so because you use causal language like impact and effect, like on page six. Um, so and yeah, we did as a committee we we had some critical comments on this, um, but it seems that has not been really reflected on in the final version of the dissertation. So that's why I have uh, three related questions. Uh, first is maybe you want to defend uh, your causality claims uh, here. Um, um, what is your what are your suggestions why uh, this could be a causal uh, relationship? Um, how would you perhaps uh, check the, whether the mechanisms hold true with the data you have? Uh, um, maybe more importantly, how would you design, if you had better data, uh, a setup which would allow for uh, the inference, causal inference on the relationship between uh, export and the adoption of uh, technologies? Esteemed opponent, thank you very much for this question. I think it's a very important question and that I did try to address following the comments, changing a little bit, both in the introduction and the conclusions, the language I use. I agree that given the limitations of the data set, claiming causality, it's harder difficult. Uh, firms that start to export, they are very different indeed compared to those that don't. In the initial version of this chapter, I also use an endogenous switching model to try to control for differences in observable characteristics, and I did find similar results. However, referees from the, <laughs> from the journal I submitted prefer to use only the difference in difference in models because then I can control for non-observable characteristics. It's still, there could be confoundies and uh, non-observable varying characteristics that could explain some of the results. I do agree that claiming causality based on the data set and the model I have now, it's harder difficult. It's still, I think the results provide a very interesting result. A lot of the literature trying to explain learning by exporting through different mechanisms. And I think that the fact that firms are likely to adopt more advanced technologies can help explain part of the gains in productivity when firms start to export, they interact with different buyers, they learn from them. There's an increasing literature that's showing that exporting to advanced economies help firms to reduce information asymmetry and as a result, improve productivity. With the data set I had, unfortunately, I do not have information on destination. One thing that I would like to test is whether exporting to advanced or emerging economies has bring different results in terms of technology adoption. As I just mentioned, I'm assuming that once you start to export to more advanced economies, you would learn more, you would reduce asymmetry. The same with multinationals. There is also literature showing that when you interact with multinationals, you also learn uh, as a supplier. However, I do have this limitation in the data set. I've tried with the Ministry of Trade to get access to information. Unfortunately, I did not. In terms of designing a uh, methodology or a study that would tackle some of the impacts, some of the issues that I have in terms of causality, I thought about that uh, many times. Finding an instrument always brings different issues. Instrumental variable analysis could be a solution, but the data set, I have very little regional variation. Even though it's a study for Brazil, I only cover three states and there is limited variation among the state that I could explore in terms of a shock. Uh, Another way would be, as I've seen lately in the literature, uh, RCT, which I, firms are offered the opportunity to interact with other firms, trying to understand if these 
uh, increase technology adoption. This is a more complicated design. I will try first an instrumental variable, but again, with the data set, it's very complicated. What I'm trying to do now in a different project is expand the analysis for different countries. So I have variation across countries in terms of uh, as an exogenous shock in exporting. For instance, there's literature that shows uh, you have a reduction in imports from one country, which increases the opportunity for exporting for a one that compete in the same product. I could use that once I can build a data set with more country variation, a larger data set. So I believe I answer or I try to answer your three questions. <laughs> yes, thank you. The opposition will be continued by Professor Dr. Bart Verspaken, Professor of the Macroeconomics of Innovation and New Technologies, Union Merit Maastricht University. Thank you, uh, Pro Rector. And dear candidate, I would like to uh, continue maybe the discussion of Chapter 5 a little bit, but I'd like to do that in light of the findings that you yourself have presented in Chapter 2, and which you've also summarized in your presentation earlier in the session. And in particular, in your presentation, you concluded that the literature tends to show that there is a slower pace of job polarization in these emerging economies. And you gave three potential reasons for that. A limited adoption of modern technology. You can see where I'm going in relation to your chapter five here. Uh, structural change, which of course is a very eclectic and endogenous phenomenon, so we better not touch that too much uh, in order not to complicate things even more. And the third, uh, changes in global value chains. And this is the one that intrigues me in, uh, in connection to your chapter five, because in chapter five, you have no attention that I could notice to the specifics of trade in global value change. You talk about trade, you talk about exporting, but what the literature in global value change, uh, on, on global value change shows is that there can be very different kind of positions in global value change. You can be in a sort of captive chain where uh, technology diffusion is very limited because the, the, the party, the multinational firm perhaps, that controls the chain wants to also control the technology and so on. So I wonder uh, why you have not uh, following your findings in your literature survey of chapter two, uh, why you have not decided to adopt a global value change uh, idea of, of trade of exporting in uh, chapter five. And I would also like to know how you think the setup of the study, uh, which we've discussed already with uh, Professor Belderbos, could have changed if you would have taken uh, a global value change perspective of, uh, of exporting, rather than the traditional idea of you know, exporting maybe as a, uh, as a way of exporting final goods or, or whatever. So can you enlighten me a little bit more on what exactly do you have in mind when you talk about exporting in chapter five and how that relates or how it could be related uh, to the notion of global value change in chapter two? Thank you, highly esteemed opponent. Again, a very interesting question. I will start with the idea in chapter two and then I'll move to chapter five and see how I can answer your question. So in chapter two, the main idea was to understand that trade has also resulted in a change in the location of routine jobs. Because of reducing uh, the costs of offshoring occupations, many advanced economies move their manufacturers, manufacturing to developing economies. In the case of advanced economies, this was always posed as one possible explanation for job polarization. As you are, let's say, exporting 
routine jobs, routine tasks for the emerging economies, you reduce employment and wages of those workers, which are commonly concentrated in the middle of the wage and skills distribution, which helps in the effects in terms of job polarization. So the main focus when I was discussing in chapter two, global value chains, is how this evolution in one side resulted in job polarization in advanced economies, but it also transferred workers in routine jobs to developing economies. These different patterns helps explain why we find different results in terms of job polarization. In chapter five, uh, the focus is more on understanding how for the firms in developing economies, entering exporting markets would help, in, would help them to access advanced technologies, either because they increase uh, scale, either because it reduces information asymmetry, either because it increases complexity also related to scale in the firms, which increases the demand for uh, technology adoption or the adoption of advanced technologies. So this was the overall, let me say, thinking when I was elaborating these two discussions. The way they interact with each other is less clear because I opted to focus specifically on trade in terms of exporting. I did not have information on how those firms interacted in a global value chain. I am aware of the literature and how firms can be placed, positioned in different uh, levels, let's call in terms of a global value chain. But the only information that I had, it was trade participation in terms of do I export or not? And when did I start to export? This made very difficult for me to understand how those firms in emerging economies, in the specific case, Brazil, were interacting in a global value chain. I did not know if they were interacting with multinationals, if they were part of uh, regional value chains, if they were exporting to only advanced economies. So this, and it was a decision that sometimes comes because of data limitation, resulted in a less broad or uh, narrow focus on exporting rather than global value chains. If I may just follow up with a small question, uh, Paul Rector. Does that then mean that you are now saying that you should have at least acknowledged that the form of exporting, because that's what global value change is all about, uh, what kind of things do we export and to whom, is in fact theoretically one of the one of the of the factors that that moderates this relationship that you're trying to investigate in chapter five and. Therefore, even if you do not have the data, it should have been acknowledged at least in the discussion there and in the discussion of the results in particular. I agree. I agree that it's a uh, it's important to acknowledge. I believe I try to acknowledge partially when I try to distinguish the exporting to either advanced or non-advanced economies and how this reduces information asymmetry. But there is a missing piece that relates to where in the global value chain the firm is placed. Uh, and it would be important to acknowledge that this would also affect difference in technology adoption. However, I do believe that for the main analysis that I try to carry out, the, distinguish, the distinctions between uh, the different positions that a firm can be in a global value chain are not as important as the ones that I reflect as a driver of technology adoption. Even if firms are interacting with different positions, they still go through increasing scale, they still increase complexity, they still need to adopt 
technologies to cope with these interactions, irrespective of their placement in the global value chain. Okay, thank you. Opposition will be continued by Dr. Maria Enrica Virgilito, Associate Professor in Economics at the Institute of Economics St. Anna School of Advanced Studies, I believe, in Pisa. Please. Thank you so much. So, Antonio, congratulations for your uh, thesis. The thesis develops an empirical investigation of the relationship between technology and labor market and between export and firm technological adoption in Brazil. Overall, it offers new evidence to understand some characteristic of the Brazilian formal labor market and industry dynamics in relation with technologies. And I value the work you have done, uh, and I believe that uh, the chapters uh, are uh, bringing new evidence uh, in terms of empirical findings vis-a-vis uh, -vis our knowledge about the Brazilian economy. However, I have some comments uh, that relate basically to uh, two aspects. The first aspect is related to the way in which you actually treat structural change. And uh, this is, uh, uh, my, my question is actually motivated by the specific economy you are looking at. Uh, I did uh, found, find some form of inconsistency between uh, the first, actually the second chapter, uh, raising uh, many claims about the absence of, uh, let's say, strict, routinized type of uh, uh, technological change penetration in development, uh, in developing ec economies. And uh, uh, the, cho the, uh, the choice that you have done in chapter uh, three to implement a routinized tax index specifically to the Brazilian economy. So I was somehow uh, surprised by the fact that the way in which you treat uh, actually structural change was uh, always uh, under the carpet. So my very first question is, uh, what is your uh, understanding of the relationship between job polarization and structural change? And the second question that I do have is the um, way in which you can consider your uh, uh, findings, particularly in chapter three, as uh, generalizable in terms of uh, the Brazilian economy, considering that you are uh, mainly referring to a type of labor market that is a formal type of uh, labor market. And how does your finding actually uh, is able to the which is the, the which is the extent to which your finding is able to um, generalize and to be uh, comprehensive of destruction of the country as a whole. So, in essence, my question is: Why, if you are talking about a developing country, you incorporate a theoretical framework which is really not taking into account the developing status of the economy? Thank you. Thank you, esteemed opponent. So in terms of my understanding of structural change, I will start with this point initially. It relates also to the question posed by the highly esteemed opponent part. When I'm exploring chapter two, I'm trying to explore differences between advanced and developing economies. And the main point is to try to understand what could be the main mechanisms that are different between those economies. The first one, as, I, as is already clear, it's limited technology adoption because of many reasons. The second one is the structural change. The decline in the demand for routine tasks can occur from two sides. The first one is within sector because of the demand, the adoption of digital technologies, firms replace routine workers by technology and this reduce the demand for those occupations. The second one is by change in the structure of the economy, increase or, a de or decline in the overall employment of sectors that demand more of those jobs. What the literature says in the context of advanced economies is that the movement from industry to services redu reduces the demand 
for routine jobs, as those are more common in the manufacturing sector. What I, based on these results by Diego Comin is one of the main papers that analyzed this uh, AR paper. I moved to the context of de uh, developing economies and emerging economies, and I find that obviously the pattern is different. In many of these economies, and not, I'm not talking here exclusively uh, about Brazil, I'm talking about the context of emerging and developing economies. In many of them, we still observe transition from agriculture to manufacturing and are in process of industrialization. As I move to the context of Brazil, and I do find in chapter two that in Brazil there is a decline in demand for routine jobs, I'm focusing on a specific case among developing economies in which we already observe decline in demand for manufacturing se sector and in which we already observe a decline in demand for routine jobs. So among those developing and emerging economies, Brazil, China, and Mexico are one of the fields that, one of the fields that we already observe incipient signs of job polarization. I'm trying to, sorry, but I'm trying to remember your second question then it would be, could you please uh, remind me? Yes, my second question is related to uh, the, let's say, represent, I would say, uh, the generalization of your findings in chapter three relative to the Brazilian labor market as far as you are only considering the formal structure of the market. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, this is a limitation in terms of data because I only consider the formal labor market, which is the data that's covered in the RISE database. I agree. However, one of the points is that the demand for routine jobs is declining across the economy, both including formal and informal sector. There is also evidence not shown in my uh, thesis, but that the decline is uh, in the entire economy. What I try to understand is that even though I do not cover the informal market, I do observe what would be the impacts on those workers that are displaced and how long it takes for them to return to the formal market. This transition can be either from formal to informal, of formal to unemployment. So in that sense, I am trying to understand how this declining demand for those type of occupations reduces the overall employment in the formal market for those workers and how it reduces their wages in comparison to workers in non-routine occupations. In terms of how this relates to the overall structure of the economy, we do mention in chapter two, and I think chapter two serves as a background, a theoretical background to the chapter, that informality is another uh, explanation to reduce job polarization in developing economies. In chapter two, we do mention that because of the extent of informality and because of the lack of capability among those firms and other issues that are associated there is limited technology adoption in, let's call, part of the economy. So we also decide and believe that most of the adoption and most of the impacts are concentrated in the formal market. And therefore, we believe that most of the uh, understanding of the overall impacts of technology adoption would be by studying the formal market. Thank you so much. I just have very, very, very brief question about your uh, reply in terms of uh, uh, substitution effect of technology in informal uh, labor market. Could you give me an example of an occupation that is part of the informal labor market and that is affected by technological change in a routine task, uh, let's say, flavor? Thank you. And then I stop here. Well, thank you, Simon opponent.
The informal market in developing economies is significantly large, and they include large firms as well. As you go to the countryside of those economies, you observe manufacturing companies with highly large and complex systems that use uh, advanced technologies. They do not, they are not formal because they opt not to pay taxes or because paying taxes would be a burden that would make them impossible to survive in the market. They, they are indications, including using the firm level adoption of technology survey that I use in the fifth chapter, that informal firms in Senegal do adopt computers, they do adopt internet. So technologies associated with the digital transformation that I discussed uh, in, in, in the overall thesis. So sometimes I believe that we have an understanding of informal market that is very small, which is true in most cases, but there are also in those economies, very large and complex informal companies that do adopt digital technologies, do adopt uh, uh, machinery that replace manual work, not robots, I know, <laughs> but they do adopt uh, machinery, electric machinery that replace some uh, hard, uh, heavy manual work. And that can therefore reduce the demand for certain tasks. Thank you so much. Thank you. The session will be continued by Dr. Mercedes Teruel, Associate Professor at the Department of Economics of Universitat Rovira i Virgili. Please. Good afternoon. First of all, I would like to give thanks to the uh, University of Maastricht uh, for the invitation to be a member of the PhD Defense of Antonio Suarez. And also, uh, I would like to advance my congratulations to, to the PhD candidate and, and his supervisors. I think that uh, your thesis in general, uh, you are contributing also to the, to the knowledge of the relationship between the uh, technology adoption and, and the incidence in the labor market and the relationship with uh, uh, the international openness of, uh, of the companies. Um, however, also I have uh, some particular, uh, some specific questions. I would focus on, on some particular, um, uh, in the particular topic of the digitalization. Uh, in particular, the chapter chapter three, uh, you analyze a specific period of uh, how the uh, the level of routinization of the of the occupations of the workers affected by a, a mass layoff uh, are um, have the chance, the likelihood of of uh, uh, finding a new job and, and also the incidence in the, in the wages. And I was surprised initially by the period of time that you are analyzing, which is the period, more or less, if, I, if I'm not wrong, of 2001 to 2013. And uh, I think that it is, a, I was wondering why you didn't find uh, a, a more recent uh, uh, database. This is the first question in particular, given the fact that the arrival the, of the new digital technologies of uh, in the artificial intelligence, uh, uh, the use of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the 3D printing and also the open codes and so on have arrived in the recent, uh, in the recent years. And I think that uh, perhaps the, the influence of, uh, of these new digital technologies may have uh, affected to this, to, they could affect to, to your results. And also uh, taking into, into account that since uh, that we have been affected by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, and this has also accelerated the, the digitalization level of the companies. So all these different um, um, changes in the, in the technological context of the firms may have also affected to, to somehow to your results. So my question would be how uh, this uh, new context of a uh, higher accelerated uh, digitalization, also the use of these new digital technologies that they can be completely different from the ones uh, used uh, one decade uh, before can affect 
to your uh, results in terms of employment, also the, uh, the skill occupation uh, capacity to, uh, to change of, of occupations, and also in the job polarization. Um, also, it was, uh, in, part in particular, this is related with uh, a previous comment, uh, taking into account that uh, Brazil can be highly affected by informal jobs. And I was thinking whether this, and this is a second block of, uh, of, uh, of um, questions, uh, whether these new digital technologies could open new opportunities to this informal job to uh, find new business models, to, to generate uh, new businesses that, uh, uh, that generate an employment growth and also economic growth in general to transform your, your economy. So it is a, a general question, particular questions, whether you don't have uh, more recent data and whether this, uh, this data can affect to your, to your results and which are the potential effects. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. I will start with uh, your question on the data. The data goes until 2018 in the analysis of chapter three. The shock that I look at is 2009 to 2013. So workers are displaced between 2009 and 2013. And I need to look then for a period of time afterwards, which is five years. At the time I had the data, not only me, but I think the Brazilian office only had the data until 2019. And gathering the data is a quite hard task. Uh, it's a data that is not publicly available and you need to request. And the, the way I accessed the data initially was part of a project which authorized the use until 2018. So I do get, especially in the terms of after displacement, this more recent period in which there is advancement in, in digital technology. So I do believe I'm already capturing most of this transition, especially for the last cohort. So there is, I think this is actually one very interesting thing of the analysis that I capture cohorts that enter the labor market at different periods of time. There's a very large literature on job displacement on labor economics. And one of the findings is exactly that, that depending on the time you arrive at the labor market, following the displacement, it affects completely uh, your outcomes. So I do have different periods, a period that's very high growth, which is the period right after the crisis of 2008. In Brazil, we rebound the red in 2009 and we grow very fast until 2012, 2013. For the less group, we are actually gathering a period of slower growth. Uh, so we are getting, I would say, a sample with a diverse uh, conditions in the labor market. In terms of the effect of the COVID-19 and on the adoption of technology, there is a project uh, that looks at it's a survey, it's a very interesting survey that looks at the adoption of firms following the, the COVID-19. And they do find that it's for adoption of digital technologies, especially online sales, which is not surprising, but all technology related to, related to payment methods and sales methods, uh, they were increased. Also some technology related to business administration. I did look afterwards in a different project once I got data for 2019 and 2020, if there was a difference between 18 and 20, the difference was very small, small in the Brazilian labor market. There was not a significant increase in job polarization. One of the reasons I believe is that in the Brazilian context, there was, and very different from the American context, there was very small transition uh, during the COVID. In the US, we see this literature popping up, showing that workers move to better jobs. There is an increase in wages and, and, and other types of results. In Brazil, the government was very fast in securing jobs. So for few firms, especially large firms, 
they got some benefits that allowed them to continue with their workers. So in Brazil, we had very little transition during this period. And therefore, I believe this could be one of the results, one of the reasons why we don't see such a large impact right after. This is not to say that this impact that we observe after the COVID-19 could have spurred technology adoption. And we could still see a continuous increase afterwards. We need more data to observe this, uh, this more recent period from 2020 to 2014. For the specific case of Brazil, we do not have this information. But this could have indeed spurred technology adoption in certain uh, areas, certain business functions that could then uh, impose job polarization in the country and, and, and increase the extent in, in which the decline in the demand for those occupations uh, existed. Finally, I think you mentioned how technology adoption could facilitate uh, transitions in terms of employment growth and, and, and offering opportunities for the informal markets. This is something that I truly believe. Uh, there is a project that I'm currently participate that look at digitalization in Africa. And it shows that in many ways, firms in, in Africa are lacking technology adoption. It's, of course, especially in the formal sector, but even firms in the formal sector are lacking technology adoption, not only in terms of infrastructure to adopt, but they do not adopt. And very interesting, one of the findings that we have currently is that some of these firms, they adopt, but they do not use these technologies intensively. There is a large discussion on how firms should adopt these technologies, but sometimes these technologies arrive at the firm, but they do not have the capabilities to use them intensively. In the sense that, let's assume you have a firm using two different technologies, manual and a computer. They learn how to use a computer, but they more often go to the menu. They continue to write their uh, uh, their sales and, and other information manually instead of using the computer. So there is a long uh, way, especially more uh, in less advanced economies, uh, this uh, emerging economies in Africa and some in Asia, to spur technology adoption that could definitely improve productivity and employment uh, in some sectors. If I can add uh, one point, I would have suggested you to change the order of the chapters. Uh, my suggestion would be that chapter five should be chapter three, uh, because logically I would uh, think that uh, you should analyze uh, first how companies they adopt uh, the new technologies and afterwards the, the, to talk about the, uh, the relationship with the labor market. This is just a I suggest you. Okay, thank you. Uh, the opposition will be continued by Dr. Emanuela Pugliese, researcher at UNU Merit, Maastricht University. Uh, thank you. Uh, dear candidate, first of all, congratulations for the completion of the thesis. Uh, uh, very nice read. Uh, I will keep uh, my question uh, again on chapter four. Um, so the chapter is based on the, is, is it theoretically based on the idea that uh, ge geography still matters, that uh, you look uh, at uh, jobs in, in uh, your region. And uh, however, what I found is that uh, geography is not, is not very clear the role of geography in the, the chapter. Uh, the, the, the unit of measure is this meso region, but there is, I couldn't find any definition of what the meso region of what a meso region is uh, in the thesis. Uh, how big they are, uh, how um, how many there are. So I think it's I mean it would be nice to to hear a bit uh, um, which kind of geographic analysis uh, you have in mind, and most importantly, if you think it really is geography that uh, have a role here. In the sense, uh, and in the sense, uh, do you think that the results would change uh, dramatically using a different uh, size uh, of uh, the region? Do you think that uh, really the uh, geographical distance that matters in skill choices is in the region? How how would the results change by looking at, uh, for example, at states or uh, at uh, or at the country itself? I mean, uh, 
I think in the thesis, there are moments that are it's not very clear what you're looking at in the sense that, uh, for example, the measure of OCI that you define uh, is defined for each, prof pro for each profession at the major region. However, then in the text, you say sentences like uh, the profession that have the highest OCI, while this uh, I would imagine that is something that would be the, the profession that have the OCI in a specific major region. So I guess that you're imagining something that is uh, averaged across major region. Or, but it's not really an important part of the of your discussion. So, uh, if you can give some more information, single point. In this chapter, what we are trying to understand mostly is e skills transferability. We wanted to understand, and and I, I try to defend here a little bit the order of the chapter. So. Chapter two, we talk about job polarization. Then I try to link with the effect of Brazil. And then I look to displacement. And then I look how workers that are displaced, they can find easily a job based on their transferability. So that's how I believe there's a structure in the, in the thesis. And the importance, what we're trying to understand here is, suppose you are displaced in a micro region or meso region as we define, and I, and I can of course define better for you uh, in, in a different conversation, uh, needs to find a new job. And because of the decline in the demand for certain tasks, not necessarily routine, you need to move to a different occupation. And this relates to all technological change. We're thinking that it's a continuous process. Now if AI is not routine tasks, correct? So it's different tasks that are being replaced. You are replaced, you need to find a new job. How can you transition to different occupations? You transition based on the skills you have, the skills you have based on your education, but also the skills you acquire while working in this given occupation. What we then try to measure is how your occupation at the moment you are displaced relates to all other occupations in the economy. But of course you cannot move to all other occupations. You are limited, and I say this is when geog geography matters. You are limited because you first you are going to look in your surroundings, right? You are going to look in probably your city and series close to it. Usually, a micro region is about ten municipalities. So, if you think about one municipality, a micro region is at about ten municipalities. Meso region will be two micro, so twenty municipalities surrounding the place where you were displaced. And we use geography to control for the fact that even though, let's say, an economist is closely related to a data science, let's say, not necessarily, let's say, uh, there is only few data scientists in that area, which is an indicative of the demand for data science. So even though I'm very close, it's not such a easy movement because the demand for that occupation is also low. So the way we are using the micro region or the meso region is to weight differently for each occupation as a control for the overall demand on that region. And this is how we are using the measure. I think there are ways to improve that paper. And this is one of the papers that is the paper that hasn't been published and I'm continuing to work on it. And I believe there is ways to improve it. One would be to try to disentangle these results. First, to understand how much geography is important, leaving transferability aside. How is the, what is the extent of workers' transition across regions? Do workers move in Brazil or they try to stay in their area? Then if you assume that they stay, how I can wait for the demand for certain occupations, including their own occupation, how it affects. And then I look at transferability. So I could uh, try to split the results to make the storyline clearer uh, in terms of what I'm looking at. But currently the focus is transferability and the way uh, the geography matters is I can only transfer. Uh, to close to jobs that are close to to mine. Thank you. The discussion will be continued by Professor Dr. Rene Belderbos. We have maybe a short amount of time. Yes, yeah, so thank you, uh, Prorek. So I, I better have a one sentence question. 
Um, um, link, linking up to the question of Professor Verspagen earlier, uh, in your introduction in chapter two, you discuss that the relationship between job polarization and, um, and uh, adoption of technologies is might be different in emerging economies. And one reason for that is that uh, the emerging economies are characterized by structural change. So my question is, what do you find in your three chapters on Brazil uh, to say something about the role of structural change as uncovered in these chapters? Well, I asked. Donio Suarez Martins Neto, the time appointed for defending your thesis has passed. The degree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and your defense. I request that you and your company await the results of our deliberations and of our return. Thank you.
Antonio Suarez Martins Neto. The degree, the degree committee here present online has assessed the quality of your thesis and your defense. In view of its positive verdict and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Professor Monen is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom. I invite your supervisor to now take the floor. Antonio, I have to ask you a last question. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? Yes, I do. Thank you. By the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present online, I hereby confer upon you Antonio Soares Martins Neto, the degree of doctor, and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, you will soon receive the degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary, and the supervisor, affixed with the official seal of the university shown by the beadle. Professor Mornan, you will also give Philadelphia. So, um, dear Antonio, um, congratulations, first of all. And uh, let me, before I say a few more words upon you, let me thank uh, the members of the committee for having uh, read your thesis and giving you comments. And uh, I'll speak in the name of my uh, two co-supervisors, Nandita and Alex, and I think they will agree with what I'm going to say. This is one was one of the easiest uh, theses to supervise. Um, and it's partly to do with the fact that uh, you came with a lot of experience. You already worked at ECLAC, you worked at the World Bank, you worked in uh, back home in Brazil. So you had a lot of experience. You also came with data sets, uh, the data set on uh, um, on, on Brazil and the data set on the adoption of new technologies. Uh, actually, you could have finished in uh, less than four years. You could have finished in three years. But I had a little bit of feeling that you were waiting for a job to open and your goal was really to work at the World Bank. And when that position became open and you were given a chance, then you quickly uh, managed to finish. Um, Sometimes I had the feeling at the meetings we have from time to time, you know, you organize the meetings uh, an hour with uh, your supervisors. And sometimes I had the feeling at the end of the hour, did he really want us to give him comments or did he just try to direct us in a certain direction to, to approve his choice of topics? The difficulty for us was not so much to, um, to correct the uh, methodological uh, choices that you made, but it was more to restrain you. I remember when we first met, you had five, six ideas, and you have five, six projects already. Mostly, you know, students come to us and don't know exactly what to do for their PhD thesis, and you were full of ideas. So we had really to constrain you to, to work on one topic at a time. So you have a lot of publications already at uh, your stage of your career. You know, uh, in the research policy, ICC, World Trade Review, World Bank Research Observer, and probably there are other ones that are already in the pipeline. You were very smart in a way in uh, trying to get assistance and um, training, if I may say, by a number of different people. You had Javier Sirera, first of all, from the World Bank. You had Alex, with whom you read all the paper. You had uh, Nandita, Tanya, and me on another paper, um, Didier Fouarge on another paper, and uh, 
Javier and uh, Diego Comin and other co-authors on another paper. So he had a lot of people with a lot of experience giving you a lot of good advice. I think this this is a, a very uh, smart way of, uh, of 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 getting uh, training from from outside. So I I wish you good luck uh, at the World Bank. I hope that you like the job that you now have. You are still not completely happy, but be patient. You know a better job will come up, and I'm sure uh, you are in in a position where you can have a, a wonderful career at the World Bank. So I wish you all the best. Dear Dr. Suarez Martins Neto, also on behalf of Maastricht University, I congratulate you with the degree you have acquired. I hereby declare this ceremony ended. <laughs>